So, welcome to the last session of today. Um, I hope this will be exciting for you to keep enough to keep your, your eyes open after a, after a long day of, of uh, presentations. Um, this session is about fossil fuel scarcity and or overabundance. What is it in reality out there? And what's the implications of different ideas of whether we are overabundant or scarce on fossil fuels? What's the, what's the pros and cons for, for development? Um, of course, as all of us know, that access of energy is closely related to development. No energy, no development, at least if we look into history. And through history, in recent history, the overabundance of fossil fuel have been, a, of course, the chief source of energy on, on which the whole remarkable development of the last couple of hundred years have, have been propelling the, de the development and most uh, lately uh, exemplified by China's matchless development which has been propelled by abundance of very cheap coal. At the same time, as we all know, the same fossil fuels is responsible for uh, the, the, it's the main responsible for, for, for climate change, threatening future development. The focus of global and national debates to date have been about how to reduce the use of fossil, fossil fuels in order to limit catastrophic, catastrophic effects of, of climate change. But this panel instead will then focus on the pros and cons of the fossil fuel supply and discuss the role of fossil fuels in the future. And this, we believe, is an area of research that um, you know, many environmental researchers seem either not want to talk about so much or are simply quite ignorant about. So is the world, or parts of it, long or short on fossil fuels? And what are the wider environmental and geographical implications of that. So my name is Carl Halding and I'm leading one of the research themes here at SCI, the Rethinking Development theme, where we are actually bothering ourselves with these types of, of, uh, of, of broader questions around uh, development. Now, in order uh, to make this session a bit more dynamic, I have also invited my colleague and good friend Per Klevenes, who's leading the new climate economy project here at SEI as a sidekick to help you know, frame trick questions uh, and to help me to pick up you know, all sorts of questions from you in the audience. We will organize this session a little bit differently than the previous sessions. So instead of having six consecutive um, PowerPoint presentations, we will invite the panelists two and two up here uh, to present their main arguments during you know, five minutes each or ten minutes together, and then we will have a short ten-minute Q&A, picking up questions from you and questions from Pear, and then towards five o'clock we will wrap up. But I thought since I have Pear here, and, and there are no other sessions here on the new climate economy, which is a very, very interesting project. Pear, what is the new climate economy all about? So long and short answers to that. But the, to start with, the premise of the project is, is as Annika uh, introduce this morning, is very much one of recasting the discourse about taking climate action and mitigation in particular. Um, the debates have been very stuck in something, in thinking very linearly about climate as changing the way we do things in a more expensive way, this is bad for the economy. And uh, it, the, the premise of the new climate economy then is to start from decision makers' current agendas, not starting from the climate agenda necessarily, thinking about the concerns, whether it's security, whether it's growth, jobs, uh, and perhaps also the, the longer-term strategy for development, and thinking about how they overlap, overlap and what, they, what a climate overlay means on top of that. And of course, the picture that emerges isn't as simple as one that simply says um, there are costs of climate mitigation, but that there are multiple areas of co-benefits, um, and there are areas where, where security concerns and climate action can overlap. It's not a question of trying to pick out, air, just identify a list of overlaps and, and conflicts. Uh, it's much more about thinking quite deep and hard about the drivers of economic growth um, as we look for the next decade and beyond, and then thinking about concrete actions in the short and medium term in particular, 
where climate mitigation and uh, broader economic objectives can, um, can mesh together for two one agenda. So that's in the abstract, and hopefully it will become clear a little bit in the session in directional questions, the type of, more types of questions that we try to investigate there. Well, hopefully you will be um, find food for thought here during these sessions. Uh, we have divided then, um, the, the, the session into, into three panels. As I said, the first one is about what we could learn from history with a certain focus on, on biofuels, which Francis uh, Johnson will soon talk about. Uh, the second uh, mini panel will be around the new fossil fuel economy. Uh, are we short or long on, on the fossil fuel supply? And uh, the third mini panel um, are focusing on questions around whether environment and resources constraints is driving geopolitical change and how that could affect um, the prospects for, for um, sustainable development. So I invite the first mini panelist up here, um, Francis Johnson and, uh, and Goe Han. Five minutes, Francis. Okay, thanks to the organizers today and a special thanks to the session organizers for cutting our time from 10 minutes to five minutes. Um, <clears throat> I, I was able to reduce my slides from eight to three, but not to zero. Um, so some um, many years ago, I, uh, my professor, uh, in fact, my best professor said, um, the only subject you need to study is history, or every subject you study must include history. And I think that, um, uh, I don't know, I kept this for, for many, many years. I wasn't really able to act on it, but finally, um, I have started thinking recently about um, and, and gathering some data about um, the very long-term uh, use of, of, of energy, in particular biomass energy. Now, long-term for you know the, the policy people is like you know 10, 20 years, but I'm talking hundreds of years because we have this record to learn from. So um, <clears throat> now the title of the talk is lessons. I'm not going to give you any lessons because it's work in progress, but I throw out a few ideas and. And then we see if it stimulates some, some thoughts. So um, if you look uh, over time, uh, the, the, in 200 years, the, the, sh the, the shift that has gone on it can be thought of you know, based on the, the, the basic fuels, biomass, uh, and then followed by, by fossil fuels, and then follow, uh, followed by hydro and, and nuclear. And um, what you're reminded of, of course, is that um, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly, it's not as fast a process as we think, shifting from one fuel to another. And um, the, uh, if you look at the 19th century, um, almost all of the energy used was still uh, biomass. And I should point out that it was basically biomass from, from forests, whereas today we have a much more uh, diverse set of biomass resources uh, available compared to then. So then you, then you see that uh, at the turn of the century, things are getting very dynamic. Um, and um, interestingly, coal's uh, share of, uh, of global energy was peaking around the turn of the, the century as, as the new uh, fossil fuels came in. Oil, uh, followed by gas, and then, uh, of course, hydro and, uh, and nuclear. And then, if you look at this curve, um, at the very top of the curve is, is biomass, so it's been shrinking over time, but what has happened in recent um, uh, decades is that it's flattening. And it's flattening for two reasons. One is that the, in, the, in the least developed countries, they are still very dependent on biomass. And, uh, so, uh, and the population growth in those areas is much higher than the world average. So the actual amount of um, biomass that's used for traditional purposes, just like it has been for thousands of years, is, is still quite big and um, is, in absolute terms, is not really shrinking. And then you have this other part, which is the, the modern bioenergy part, uh, both in developed and developing countries alike. Now I take you back even further in, in history, um, back to the 1400s. Uh, at this time, uh, England was uh, starting, it's getting started on, on a big transformation. And that transformation was defined very much uh, uh, on the energy side. It's common with, with energy and technology to think about uh, the saturation of a, of a fuel as 90%, uh, you know, which means it's almost completely dominating the market. 
or 10% when it's just getting a hold in the market. So what I show you here is um, various countries and regions, the time period it took to go from 90% biomass to 10%. And so you see that uh, the UK, I should actually say England, England and Wales. Um, so it was about 300 years. Uh, now, what, also what you can see from the, from the chart is that um, uh, they basically completed this transition before anyone else even started. Um, and so this idea of the, the first mover, you know, in, in this case in, in energy and industrialization, is true in many other fields. And so the first mover is still, of course, very important and, and has a big effect. And by the way, during this period, they were industrializing so fast and they needed wood constantly uh, because coal was just becoming available. So they were importing wood. You can imagine how costly it is to import bundles of wood. And uh, what country was the main supplier of wood to England? Sweden, <clears throat> which is also an interesting historical fact. Now, now Sweden is, is quite the opposite, is a, is, um, has plenty and is a, in some, sometimes is a net exporter. Um, so anyway, you see the other regions and countries making this transition. Um, the non-OECD countries, that is uh, the developing countries, have still not come down to, to this figure. Um, and in fact, they, uh, uh, they probably never will. Uh, and another fact I found interesting when I was gathering this data is that um, the share of biomass in uh, Sweden and in developing countries um, is actually about the same, 23%, which um, is interesting. And so I say, hey, Sweden's just like any other developing country, you know. But, um, but this is an important point because the, the amount of uh, uh, bioenergy used in Sweden, it has from the end of this graph, it has increased about 10 10 times, a factor of 10, but the area of planted forest has increased. This is hard for most people to understand. How can the, and it's mostly woody biomass, how can you get 10 times as much energy and have more forest? Well, it's good management. Um, so land is not as, as scarce a resource as, as the NGOs would like you to think. Uh, it's a question of doing things well. So um, just to finish, um, I should say also that, and maybe now I want to go back to the other slide, is that, so here we are with this little chunk at the top of biomass, which, which I'm saying it probably will start to bend down this curve. And, but the difference is, is that it will be heterogeneous. So these other sources, coal, oil, gas, hydro, nuclear, they're rather heterogeneous. Uh, the homogeneous is what I meant to say, whereas biomass is heterogeneous. They're an infinite number of applications. So we're entering into a very different situation with a resource like this, and that's the basis of the bioeconomy. So it's no longer, these transitions are no longer uh, straightforward the way we used to be, where we have our energy slaves, which is fossil fuels. Um, it's different now. We have to deal with a much more varied uh, situation and uh, very different applications. Okay, five minutes, barely. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Francis, and um, I think we will have opportunity to come back to a few of those questions um, after Gori has presented yeah. some of his thoughts around um, a lock-in as something that we are not usually as concerned about as uh, we're more interested in transitions, but we often forget about uh, the lock-in and whether we could learn anything from history around avoiding lock-in and path dependencies yeah. and such things. Gori. Uh, I'll use Francis to think for two things. One is the opening sentence that said, one of the professors of mine told me when I started the risk, by the way, Roger is sitting there, say so you have to always know what is the real risk. And when I look at China today, increasingly, I think it's not the flooding, not the earthquake, is in this rapid transition we're locking into so many things that eventually will cost China a, a tremendous a great deal. The other thing is that exactly that graph I was uh, purposely left there. If you look at that transition of the energy systems since the Industrial Revolution, I think that today, and what is remaining on the top part, where the biomass is still predominant, is the developing countries, we call it, is where that pattern is going to evolve the next. 
is going to copy what is down there, which is largely coal, oil, gas, uh, and, and it's going to transition into something as the earlier session we talked about, be that it, you know, the energy system transition, be that inclusive or, or some other terms. I, I think that's where this wonder, uh, what we, uh, we talk about the notion of locking is, let me put it another way, really the impetus for us to think about this is, will the emerging countries, all the developing countries in general, repeat the carbon lock in pattern in the energy system as it did the rich countries since the Industrial Revolution. So that's basically, you know, I could have just stopped here. And, uh, uh, but, you know, since we reduced to one, I will not talk about what is the lock-in, but just to say that it's not all lock-in by itself is a bad thing. And as fact, the lock-in is a mechanism. We increase efficiencies, so we benefit from the you know, economic scale and all that. It's just those lock-ins in our case, primarily that the choices made in the development pathways that later on turned out has a major unintended environmental consequences. And we're interested in those kind of lock-ins uh, uh, that, and why should we care about it? And um, I would not talk about it, but we should. Uh, what we already know, I would definitely not talk about that. Uh, why is, uh, I don't know what we already know, but you know, I also know what we, a lot what we already know. So that could take all the time. But what more do we still need to know? You know, there's a lot yet we need to know, but who has the time? Um, <laughs> so I'll just talk about three. And one is a typology of locking. I, I think it's a lot of those talking in the literature now, and at least to me, we don't have a, you know, much thought into, there's all kinds of lock-ins, and they do differ differ, and in terms of how easy they get out, the mechanism through which they may be broken and get out. Uh, for example, if a specific technology locking versus a technological system locking it is drastically different. And then it's this whole area's work, I think in the area I studied, we often call it a hidden hazard. Then it's increasingly, we see the literature called this unintended consequences. And it's the inertia and the time lags. And increasingly now, with a case study we are starting with some colleagues in China, it's really take on to look at will China lock in in terms of the uh, car dependency or the motor vehicle dependency as what we are seeing in the US. Uh, and what we are arguing is that not going to happen because this so-called check time. It takes much less time for the system to kick back the unintended consequences or the check information to the decision makers saying that, no, this is the past, you cannot go down. Whereas in the US, you know, we have roughly the same size of land as in China, but you know, quarter of the population for so many years. So they have the land and all that. I will not get into that. But the notion here plays to say the check time, uh, look at the system, uh, is an important one to understand you know, how locked is locked in. The third one is can we have a framework and tools for assessing this very notion of how locked is locked in. Um, and the last layer, of course, how to know what we need to know, and I don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Goy, for, for keeping the time, and, and please um, join us here for a few questions. I think, Per, you, you had a question to lead into this discussion. Yeah, I mean, um, this sort of provides me with a get out of jail card to ask any question I want, right? Because Goy is sort of, you know, said you're not going to talk about all of this. Um, so, I mean, it can't very much. And while Perry is asking this question, if you have any questions, you know, raise your hand and pick one or two of those. 
Um, the, the question I'd like to ask then is, so one, one common learning from these two things is, of course, you know, France, if you look at the, the historical record of how slow, actually, the biomass transition has been, or any other energy transition, really, if you want, even vastly superior technologies take a long time to, to reach the 90%. And very often is for the reasons that we're painfully aware of, of limited um, that now limit an energy access to, to a large, for a large part of the world's population. Um, so given that it is very slow, and given that lock-in is much more than just building a piece of infrastructure or capital asset that lives for a long time, which is how the IEA, for example, talks about lock-in, that it's about market arrangements, that it is about um, social norms, that it's about acceptability of technology, um, that it is about financing constraints at a very micro level, and all sorts of other things. Now, what, one question one can ask oneself, and what, what does this mean for looking ahead to a low-carbon transition? Um, and, and biomass is a very interesting case here, uh, the role of biomass in that. But the, the question really is then, if you contrast the sort of shiny supply-side scenarios that show what's, te what's technologically possible and paint a pathway where we can say we meet all of these energy services, these, these te technologies, with existence of energy efficiency opportunities that have been around for 40 years or more, showing the big gap in what, uh, what energy efficiency we could have cost-effectively compared to what we do, we're confronted with a huge discrepancy here. Uh, where the lock-in is one of, of a very slow transition away from technologies that we have towards ones that might be better, whether from a development or price or carbon point of view. Now, the question then is, what does this mean for policy? Um, how can policymakers try and accelerate this without also making such heavy-handed interventions that they cause other trouble? Again, your, your hidden hazard. Um, so I, if you could reflect on that <laughs> maybe from, the, from the two perspectives you presented. I can go. Um, what? Well, immediately, I think it's two, perhaps two reflections. So one is that uh, um, the lock-in, if we look at, you know, limited eye reading, for example, the economics literature, we say, you know, the technology eventually, they will be replaced. So in a way, if you leave to the market long enough, you know, certain lock-ins will go up. You know, because you know, it's all kinds of that mechanism that economists tell us, and I do believe that's perhaps is true. But the, the difficulties in us that we are facing today, my understanding is the urgency of the climate change issue as such that doesn't allow that breaking this carbon locking pass entirely by the market force. And that will take too long and too much emission that leave the climate issue without any resolution. Uh, so I guess in the between is your question, and uh, of course I have no clue, and how that our combined government and, and the private partnership, borrow a popular term, can you know, accelerate uh, that transition. And one thing I, I think is, you know, always a f fan of that. We have real experts like Munz and uh, Oliver earlier the introduction. This environmental technology, innovation, diffusion, research tradition, the, the transition management. And we think there, for example, this very key notion of uh, uh, the niche, strategic niche management. I guess that's where we need to think more. And where is that in accelerating this? Is in that just not to go back to the earlier session, but that's where you know, I thought also you know, being in, emphasizing the inclusive is really strategic uh, in, in terms of when we think what would be the strategic niche to speed that transition. Um, of course, it, by the end, being inclusive is important. I don't know whether it made any sense, but... Um, yeah, that was complex. I've forgotten the question now, but... Uh... <laughs> I, I will try. I, I think that um, the lock-in, you know, uh, lock-in can be, there's a technical infrastructure part of lock-in. Okay, you have all that. Um, there's also a certain sociocultural lock-in. As an American who moved here many years ago and has not owned a car for 15 years, I can vaguely remember now the American love affair with the automobile, you know. And it's a, that's a certain type of lock-in as well, right? But um, And so the example with regard to... Um, uh, policy 
uh, in this respect. The, the Swedish example is interesting here because they purposely experimented with different pathways for alternatives in the transport sector, biogas, electric cars, biofuels, etc. So generating different alternatives and experimenting, this is uh, very useful. And the willingness to fail, uh, bureaucrats usually uh, are, are much more scared of failure than they are happy about success. So um, if you can create a culture in, in governments and, and uh, in agencies in general that the willingness to experiment and fail is very important. And um, that's another reason why I find bioenergy very interesting because like I was saying earlier, there's an infinite number of, of ways to, to implement and uh, the different feedstocks applications. Whereas um, the transitions we've gone through in the past, they're actually very linear. We need energy. We want to do more, we get more, we just suck it out of the ground and keep going. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't think this is going to work in the long run. So, uh, well, it's not going to work by definition, but um, are you willing to invest more now to avoid much pain later, I guess is the question. And then you have to leave that linear mindset and um, think uh, much more multidimensional. Um, and that's, that's what the, the new renewables will hopefully offer as well as uh, efficiency and, and so forth. Oh, thanks a lot. And uh, please um, stay on the stage here while we um, turn to the next mini panel. Uh, Pete and uh, Mike, welcome up. Uh, Charlie, we will keep the question for, for later because uh, we have to keep the time schedule. Uh, Goy and um, uh, Francis, please come up here and uh, join us on, on the stage. All right. yeah. um, so the second uh, mini panel here is, um, is around the new fossil fuel economy, which is something that uh, uh, Michael and Pete have been doing uh, quite a bit of research around. Um, and are we short along on fossil fuel supply? And uh, how should we deal with this? Um, the two papers uh, in the abstract, but uh, I guess you will actually do a, a joint stunt here on, on this. Or do you, are you going to do it one by one? Anyway, it's a, a common entanglement a case of Inner Mongolia, uh, of Mongolia, sorry, Pete Erickson, and then Mike, a toolkit for climate action's new frontier and the Keystone test. Please. Thank, thank you, Carla. Uh, it will be sort of a joint presentation. We've, we've, we've split up some topics, but. Um, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> you can be the judge of that. Um, so we, we've been doing some research uh, on this notion of unburnable carbon. Uh, the idea that if we are going to limit global warming to two degrees, say, or, or less, um, that we can only burn so much more carbon. There's a lot more than that in the ground, and so we're going to have to not not burn some of the, the carbon, some of the fossil fuels that, 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 we, that we have. Um, I think this is not a surprise to, to anyone here, um, but I think I'll read one quote from OECD Secretary, Secretary General Guria um, that I think sort of brings the, the challenge to, to, to be really clear. Um, the fact is that any new fossil resources brought to market, conventional or unconventional, risk taking us further away from the trajectory we need to be on. A very strong tide is what we call carbon entanglement, that governments everywhere, on behalf of their citizens, have major stakes in bringing fossil fuels to market and taking their share of the rents. Carbon entanglement will not be easily undone. These are some of the strongest tides we have to confront. Um, and this is becoming um, perhaps increasingly uh, accepted. We heard this morning um, from Char Charlotte that this w in, in started to become a theme at the World Economic Forum last week. Um, but we also heard that low carbon development um, really needs to, to benefit um, the poor. And if the fossil fuels are gonna have to be, you know, if, if most of them are gonna have to be left in the ground, that brings up some really interesting and thorny questions about um, who has to leave them in the ground and who gets to, gets to burn them. Um, so one very, uh, I think, interesting case study that we've been working on is, this, is the country of Mongolia. Um, Mongolia is a very poor country by many standards. Uh, 
per capita GDP of between three and four thousand um, dollars. Yet it has uh, the economy that's most dependent on coal exports of any in the world. Um, this shows this chart is from data from the World Bank that shows that um, coal represents about 30%, nearly one-third um, of Mongolia's GDP, which is, is extraordinarily high. Um, and this raises a number of questions, risks, um, to, its, to the competitiveness of its economy, both in terms of whether it's investing uh, enough in other sectors, but also is this income stream from coal likely to be there uh, in the future? Are the markets, is the demand going to be there? Um, last week, uh, also at the World Economic Forum, there were some scenarios presented on uh, the key source of demand of Mongolia's coal, China, and whether um, per perhaps in, in one scenario, China takes its coal caps seriously and ratchets them down and you know, potentially is, is no longer a giant producer of steel, which is the other, um, which also demands significant quantities of coking coal, and in which case, if, if that were to play out, if if coal demand from China and other major economies were to decline under, say, uh, a, a two-degree scenario, um, what would that do to, to Mongolia's economy? So there are fundamental risks and challenges that Mongolia, but also other countries, are faced that rely on fossil fuels um, for development. So the question that we are exploring uh, in our research and that Michael is going to expand upon is what tools um, and uh, analytical tools and frameworks are needed to take on this, this question because most of climate policy, most of climate policy analysis has been on the demand side, has been, on, has been looking at how do we, we burn less, of, less fossil fuels over time and there has been much less attention on the supply side on how to analyze and how to develop policy um, um, to not dig up the fossil fuels uh, in the first place. So one of the tools that, a very simple one that we've started applying in the Mongolia case is this uh, idea of extraction-based emissions accounting. Most um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions accounting is based on what emissions arise from within a country, but what if instead you looked at the emissions that, uh, that, that eventually result from a country digging up fossil fuels uh, in the first place? And in the Mongolia case, um, their territorial emissions are about 10 million tons of CO2 annually, but in their extraction-based emissions are, are, well, 10 times that now. This, this is just data through 2010. So um, their, arguably their contribution to global climate change is much greater via what they export than what they burn in country. So we've been working with the Mongolia Ministry uh, of Environment and De Development as well as the Ministry of Energy um, to raise these kinds of questions and have some of these uh, very challenging uh, d discussions that um, we can, can continue and that Michael will touch on further now. So. Oh, you can leave that off now. Should I? Should I get to you? Uh, I can, you can yeah. start and I can. Uh, well, take, take the... Uh, okay. All right. All right. Do I just kill that and then the other one comes up? All right, uh, I, let, let me just say that, that, that uh, I'm feeling very guilty. Uh, first of all, for not being inclusive enough. But we realized afterwards that I was thinking about mobile, what, what oftentimes is termed as mobilization. And so we need to think about what that word inclusiveness really means. Um, uh, also feeling guilty because if you noticed uh, when Francis and the Goyi were up here, they kept referring to that American U.S. model of development, and you kept looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, for using PowerPoint, it, it, I'm sorry, but we're from Seattle, and it's actually legislated in Seattle since that's where Microsoft comes from. That we are required to use PowerPoint at every presentation. Uh, so, uh, so it is the last PowerPoint. Uh, Magnus and, and, and Marie will, will save you for the end uh, without it. So I want to just talk a little bit about, um, wh wh I think we're on the cusp of, of, of a lot of interesting new work at, 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 at what we're doing as well as in collaboration with, with Holland and I see Balders here and, and others uh, on trying to develop a toolkit uh, the Toolkit for Climate Action's New Frontier. What is that frontier? Pete referred to Angel Gurria's uh, 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 sort of seminal talk about uh, 
carbon entanglement, unburnable carbon, and stranded assets. What happens to those uh, assets such as the coal mines and coal plants under a two degree scenario? Uh, lots of interesting research occurring on some of those issues like stranded assets, but from an analysis and accounting perspective, as we'll discuss, it's really um, a blank sheet. There hasn't been, you know, I've been working on the demand side of the equation for many, many years. And it really does seem like, for some reason, it's been our blind spot. Uh, Keystone XL. Raise your hand if you know what Keystone XL is. OK, about half, about half. So it, it, it's sort of a cause celebre for in the environmental community, uh, in the oil industry. It's a pipeline that would connect the uh, oil sands, or tar, we can't call them tar sands, oil sands in, in Alberta with the ports in Texas for export. And it passes through the US, and it requires US State Department approval, lots of reviews. And now uh, Obama, President Obama is about 70 to you know, 100 days away from having to make a decision, in which he said in his uh, climate address last year, he will only approve it if it does not exacerbate his work, exacerbate the problem of carbon pollution. So let's return to that in just a second. But what it does is it begins to say, OK, let's start looking at infrastructure, fossil fuel supply infrastructure, not just coal plants, but what brings fossil fuels to market. Uh, let me just ask a question. OK, uh, try to ignore the, the chart there for a second. Uh, fossil fuel scarcity or abundance? Raise your hand if you think it's a scarcity issue. Raise your hand if you think it's an overabundance issue. Ah. All right, well, I did kind of lead it with this slide. But I would argue, actually, it's both. Uh, and so some of you may be familiar. This is sort of our spin on the underpinning of the uh, unburnable carbon dilemma. And that shows you, in the nutshell of all I want to get across here, and we can come back to this, is the two resources that are the, that are the issue. Whether it's two degrees or three degrees or four degrees, it's still the same. It's coal. And it's also unconventional oil. That's oil sands, oil shale as in Estonia, and elsewhere, where there is more potential resource. Uh, and it's, it's also extraction techniques in other parts of the world. So lock-in also has a dimension on, 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 on energy supply. How do we reconcile the unburnable carbon dilemma with increasing investments in a coal mining in, in for instance, Colombia, where they're considering more coal mining and orienting towards the Asian market. Or Indonesia, the world's, also the world's leading coal exporter. Uh, and so what's ironic here is having worked in this area of low emissions development and in green growth studies as we were working in Mongolia, you read those studies, you read that literature, is there any discussion of the supply side you could have all sorts of energy efficiency and renewable energy and, um, in your plan, but no discussion of development based on fossil fuel exports. Because it, it's also a, um, an issue as well for low carbon competitiveness uh, of economies. So I'm going to flip through these. This is Brazil. Could, it, could, could offshore oil affect its domestic policies? Example from Estonia uh, or the Arctic. These issues are everywhere. So let me just say I'm not going to walk you through the demand and supply curves just to say that a missing element of the debate, the debate on Keystone has been dominated on this question of oil sands, tar sands. It's, it's, it's dirty and it's high emitting. Well, what we have found remarkably is that looking at its impacts in the global oil market, if it brings more oil to the market, which is an open question, is actually a bigger impact in terms of emissions, in terms of increasing consumption, and the interaction of supply and demand. We can go into that more. In the, so, so there are tools of supply and demand analysis that can be brought to the supply side that aren't being brought in uh, sufficiently. And so there is space for SEI to contribute, to develop robust analytics. That paper we're trying to, we're working on a submission to Nature Climate Change right now on that to try to build the literature on that side, understand equity implications, who can exploit the remaining space to produce fossil fuels. This is, and we're so, uh, our colleague Shivan, uh, who's very involved in equity, and you probably, many of you know him, we're exploring that question from the supply side. Um, 
very interesting questions and difficult ones. How do you integrate and other conversations going on about, oftentimes it's a water constraint, the coal development in, in China. Uh, it's a nexus issue, oil shale development in, in Jordan potentially. Um, bridge between science and policy, it's like bridge out on supply side policies. We need to start building some bridges. Is it fossil fuel production subsidy removal? Are there other innovative ideas that are out there? We're trying to explore those and develop communities of practice. So it's not just us researchers talking about it. It's, um, it, it's, it's, it's everyday implementation of doing green growth studies, and we talk about these issues. So that, thank you. Um, thank you. Um. Mike and Pete, um, you almost used your, the 20 minutes that you shouldn't have used, so there is no ooh, time really ooh. for Q&A here, uh, but a few reflections maybe. Personally, I think the idea of unburnable carbon is, is, is really interesting to, to develop further, and could it lead to expectation shifts that in, 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 in the long run could, could lead to um, shifts in how we, we, or how different actors make investments in, into fossil fuel extraction? That's an open question, of course, but... Uh, Pat, I know you have a few reflections as well. Caught me on the hop there, but all right. Uh, the, I mean, this is something that has been a pre preoccupation if you think of the, the new climate economy framework. How do you handle a world where there's long hydro, uh, hydrocarbons as well as coal? And not the, that this entanglement isn't just one of Mongolia and others, but in, in this country collects a large amount of its taxes from fossil fuels. It's a pension funds are heavily, your pensions, as far as you have built them up, are heavily invested in this as well. It, it goes much further. Um, but the problem is, if you look at the market now, the notion of a carbon bubble, uh, you have to say the whole market is wrong. You know? And oil companies are valued at 10 years of cash flow. Is, that, is it really wrong that they are going to, is there a plausible scenario where they are getting constrained within 10 years? It's, it's a very, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion to clear up in this space, and I couldn't agree more that we could have a contribution as SAI to make to this. And the notion of physical stranding as opposed to financial stranding here. And also to add that very quickly, I have to be very quick, um, <laughs> that the, um, we're working within in the, in, in the new climate economy project, we're working with partners on the climate policy initiative on the joint financing and energy questions. One of the things that we've done in, in that um, is to ask a lot of investors about this. And as you notice in, in, in the abstract, some investors are getting a bit uneasy and finance of the coal is getting more difficult. But in the main, unless there is a sh this expectation shift that actually, not just against some counterfactual pathway that isn't happening, but actually there will be constraints of you on the use of these, of these resources in the future, then it's very hard to break out of this investment pattern that we have now, where very large amounts are being invested for exploration in the Arctic and elsewhere. Shifting that investment and tremendous innovation capacity towards the low-carbon sector through an expectation shift is another influencing channel also for the international community that isn't often thought about as we haggle over carbon budgets and allotments and, and, and all of this. Um, so I think it's a fruitful area. So it wasn't a question, it was a reflection. <laughs> So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Peter and Mike, come and, and join us here on, on the stage. We'll see if there are some time left over for questions uh, oh, later. Oh, no, no, that was fine. It was very, you know, very interesting. So um, Magnus and Marie, please um, join us here. So th this is the, the final mini panel of, of today. Um, with the question, are environment and resources constraints driving geopolitical change? So, Maria, you're first out. It's about um, the new geopolitics of environmental constraints, changing ecosystems and resources competition. And Magnus will then uh, say a few words around something else, <laughs> something around strategic, um, how countries are dealing with strategic resource risks. Yeah, I'm Which just is, wondering... And both of these things are generally related to one another, I, I hope, but... Um, I'm just wondering, as a matter of um, organizing ourselves on stage, if we should get our colleagues to come join us here so that it looks a bit more like a panel now that we're yes, not using slides. Yes, since we don't slides. have any, no more slides. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll try to be, be brief. I'll see if I can manage. Um, as Kalle mentioned, we've uh, spent quite a bit of time trying to understand the world geopolitics, which seems to be popping up every so often in not only in mainstream media and news articles, but also in the academic literature. And while I've now spent 
a good couple of months trying to understand really what it means. I'm still struggling. So if one of you have a good good definition of what a geopolitical interest is, I'd be quite quite interested to to find out. But I think um, so. What, what you could say is that I think it's it's used in a lazy way in a way. It's used to refer to a need and a desire to understand the change that's happening in the world. And I think this change, on the one hand, has to do with change in the physical environment, so change that has to do with climate change, with environmental limitations, fossil fuel availability. But on the other hand, it also has to do with change in the political system, so the link between the physical and the political. Um, when we talk about geopolitical outlooks or geopolitical narratives, it's often referring to the changing balance of power in the uh, political system, be it the new multilateralism of chi countries like China and India and Brazil, or be it this questioning or yeah, questioning of whether uh, we're going to have a, continue to have some sort of unilateral system of a hegemon. Is it going to be the US? Is, is China going to challenge the US to this position? Uh, but I think what we're not seeing so much neither in mainstream media nor really in, in the literature, is a connection between these two. So putting the layers of the physical aspect of geopolitics onto the political one and sort of answering questions about how these physical constraints brought about by fossil fuel scarcities or resource strains or abundance for that matter, actually condition the likelihood of different geopolitical narratives. So is it really... Um, worth speaking of China as the next superpower given problems related to water stress, to over-reliance on coal and things like that. And I think this is an area where SEI has started answering questions. We've made a couple of attempts, but having seen presentations from my colleagues today, I'm even more convinced that we could become much better at answering these questions in a more systematic way. Uh, and I think this also goes back to, to Jakob's question, I can't see him now, to, to David on how, how WEEP uh, is being applied uh, in California and how this links to the broader sort of political, political economy. I think we can really use our findings from our underground, on the ground work and contribute to making more informed sort of trajectories and predictions about where, where the political system is heading and what the likelihood of various geopolitical outlooks are. Um, I think potentially, and Magnus is going to talk more about this, by doing this we could do one of the things that was mentioned this morning, which is really start bringing different policy audiences together. I think this notion of global change and where the political system is heading is something that definitely attracts attention beyond ministries of environment and development. Um, so, yeah, an area where we can make a difference, potentially. Well, I'm probably not the only one in the room who wants to hear more from Michael and Pete and the other people on the panel, so I'll try and keep this brief, um, but at least there are no slides. So, trying to pick up on a couple of different uh, things that have been mentioned earlier, I think... Um, Pete, it's almost like the opposite of your view about extraction-based accounting. And the idea I was going to talk about was um, about importing, the risk profile of a country's imports, and specifically how we can explore the resource intensity of a country's consumption. And again, I'm going to come back to York and using input-output modelling. And we'd begun a conversation earlier on in the New Climate Economy project about possibly using input-output modelling to explore countries' risk profile through the embedded fossil fuels in their consumption. Not the raw fossil fuel imports, but these modelling approaches enable you to look at the embedded fossil fuels in the goods and services that are imported. Or the virtual land or the land footprint associated with various different uh, imports to a country. And, and so we have the toolkit, follow on from what you said, Marie, within SEI to start exploring different parts of these questions, I think, and, and in particular then to explore how countries will manage these risks, how they see the consequences of resource scarcity and what the implications of that 
are for development, the implications for the environment, the implications for sustainable development. And I think we're starting to see policymakers ask those kinds of questions. It's a slightly different topic, but I was at the European Union talking about high-end climate scenarios and this complexity and uncertainty that, of these future worlds. And, and the main recommendation from the external advisory service that we spoke to on stakeholder groups outside the Commission, who to engage, was the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. These guys are doing scenario planning like you're talking about, they say. They're, they're talking your language. You should go and speak to them. So it's when we look at consequences, are we happy to leave that discussion to the Military Advisory Council or do we think SEI has something to also add to conversations about future uncertainty, future development paths, resource scarcity issues? And I think, I think uh, we do. Um, and we have a heritage of scenario work at SEI and I think we have a sort of reawakening of that um, discipline within SEI with a few new people that have joined and some recent projects. Um, and we also have a track record of starting to do what you were referring to, Marie, of talking to policymakers about these kind of geopolitical implications or taking a geopolitical lens on the things that we already study. So through like the basic work, I think we've proven that we can deliver policy-relevant messages based on this kind of research. And I think it's an angle that SEI should go to go in um, a lot more. And I think I'll leave it, leave it there and hope that you will all ask questions that make use of the whole panel. Yes. Um, thanks a lot, Magnus and, and Marie. And I, I, I think there is a, there's a number of, of, of angles this could be taken further. And, I, and one thing that just struck me here uh, at, the, at the very end is that what we have heard here from, from the panelists are issues that are quite different from the way that climate negotiation have been framed as, as com trying to find the top-down solution or of how to distribute in, in an equitable way um, a, a limited carbon space. What we're hearing about here today is rather how different countries could be acting in self-interest uh, to gauge different type of risks and how that could um, precipitate different patterns and different um, uh, strategies, which by itself could have far-reaching implications for whether or not we could reach or steer towards a, a lower carbon trajectory and or but also to what extent uh, this could lead to to new types of, of uh, uh, political uh, alliances uh, on the global and on regional arenas now that was just a reflection i hope there are some questions from the audience here right now good fine we have a good 10 12 minutes uh, to discuss this. Uh, Charlie, please. You the microphone, or did you take my microphone? This is actually more of a comment, um, just relating to mainly what Michael and Pete were talking about, and it's just uh, maybe from an outside perspective, it's hard to see why people are getting so worked up about the Keystone project in the US. You know, it's just one project. But I think one of the reasons it's so vital and one of the reasons we're all getting a bit obsessed about it in the US is because of the issues that Michael and Pete were raising. And I think it says a lot about where SEI can make a contribution in the future as well. Um, you know, traditionally, people have thought about these issues in a rather short-run way that, you know, as Pete said, is very demand-focused. And we've kind of left it up to economists to look at these questions from a very sort of short-run perspective of, you know, how are markets going to change in the short run based on the demand and supply considerations. But I think the stuff that Michael and Peter po pointing out is something that's much more fundamental and much more important and goes way beyond economics. It's about, you know, this is about precedent setting. You know, this is this this kind of one project is a sort of little is a litmus test because, you know, if the US or if Obama decides not to pursue this project, that will be basically the richest country in the world deciding to leave a very valuable resource in the in the ground and there's you know never been an instance in history of the world where that's happened before 
So that kind of much longer reign, reign well, I think maybe I'm, I think that's correct. <laughs> Someone can correct me if that's all right. But, um, but you know, that's, you know, and that's kind of that very sort of long run perspective and thinking about unburnable carbon. And that's where that, those kinds of issues come to play. And I think that's why having a program on unburnable carbon in SEI could be a really important contribution that we can make. Thanks for the comments. And any comments on the comment while I walk over to Eric oh, here? Just one thing. It's not, it's an easy, it's an easier question for Mono because it's about leaving, it's about, it, it, it's actually a question of leaving Canada's, Canada, Canada's resource in Canada. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, yeah, so I had a, a question about um, renewables versus uh, non-renewable energy sources. I do just want to say very quickly uh, that there are some traditions in economics where precedent setting can be a, a valid part of the analysis. Um, but uh, but uh, so renewables and non-renewables were put on the same graph, um, and they kind of appeared in the same way, but uh, they seem to be quite distinct in a couple of ways. One of them is that uh, <clears throat> non-renewable sources, there's a finite amount of them, but when it's a very large amount, the annual rate of supply can be expanded uh, to a considerable degree, depending on, um, well, anyway, to a considerable degree. Renewables, that's not the case. Uh, it can be expanded to some degree, but it's constrained. There's an annual supply. Um, the other one that's related to that is that the, as you keep producing non-renewable resources, the energy costs of producing them increase. Um, the energy return on investment for, uh, for um, tar sands is extremely low. Um, and, uh, and for renewables, you can degrade them, but in principle, it's possible for efficiencies to gradually improve the energy return on investment. Um, and so I was wondering if that uh, has any bearing on, on uh, what you were proposing. Well, anyone who wants to respond to that quickly? While I walk up to the next question here, you could respond. Well, well, well I can just say that I think uh, what I was also trying to point out with the homogeneous versus heterogeneous resources addresses this a little bit because it relates also to risk. When you have heterogeneous, then you're also reducing your risk, um, which is a slightly different point from what you're saying, but, but related, I think. Yeah. Hi. Uh, next question is from me. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One to Francis. Um, you mentioned there were sort of many configurations for bioenergy, different technologies, and so on and so forth. I was wondering, what do you think are the implications of this? Um, opportunities for a lot of small-scale innov innovation, more perhaps we might think of as more democratized innovation, um, and you know, are the, is this? Is there great potential for that? And you know, what do you see as the the, the implications um, of the fact that there are many different sort of technologies and and uh, resources, uh, bioenergy sources? And a question for Marie: um, In your kind of looking at the geopolitical narratives, are you focusing on the nation state in those kind of narratives, or are you also looking at more kind of um, networked approaches, network society kind of approaches and things like that. Oh, now we don't wait. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah, I would say that um, because of this great diversity, um, it does allow a lot of experimentation and I would say by nature more, more inclusive. Um, of course, it can also be very large scale and can, can cause, in some cases, some of the same problems that other large scale en energy resources create. But the point is, is that the diversity of applications and um, scales and resources is so tremendous and people always tend to underestimate it, even uh, researchers, even many of my own colleagues, in fact. Uh, and um, so, yes, I think it's a uh, potential for being, for being uh, inclusive there. Um, what, was there a second part to your question? No. Okay, I guess that's it. Marie. Marie. <laughs> Marie. 
Um, I personally tend to be very state-centric, um, as I guess you noticed. But uh, we are indeed, yes, looking at narratives created by other actors as well. Um, so noting that the world is not just billiard balls. Hi, my name is Åsa Romsson. I'm uh, MP and uh, spokesperson for the Green Party. As coming from outside, I just can't um, thank you for interesting debate and, and presentations. And I cannot uh, uh, hold on not to put your question to apply this um, uh, analysis on, on uh, to leave fossil fuels in the ground, the dilemma with that. Uh, and also in geopolitics, has any of you been looking at the uh, Arctic and the and the fossil the run for fossil fuel in the Arctic? Uh, could we pass on that question to Annika sitting up there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and Annika, a, 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 a short response uh, to that, so we yes, can have another uh, question before we wrap up. You can't look at the Arctic today without taking into consideration the geopolitics of fossil fuels because it's there, uh, and, but it's, I would also uh, remind you that it's not only the geopolitics of fossil fuels, it's the geopolitics of hydro, it's the geopolitics of uranium as well. Uh, it could, of course, combined with the military, but just taking the energy issues. So, so, yes, and I think actually I would like to also to turn around, there was a, uh, a question uh, introducing uh, Maris Magnus, is the uh, resource constraints shaping a new geopolitics? I would also ask the question, how do current geopolitical interests shape the discourse about resource constraints? Because that's also going on. There are narratives being created to, to, uh, to favor certain interests here. And we need to look at that direction as well. But yes, indeed, you, can. you have to look at the Arctic in this context. Um, I know that David has been waving a long time up there, so while you walk around to David, yeah. um, I could add also to um, what Annika just said, there, there are also sh geopolitics of shipping very much in play in, in, in Arctic. And that's an also ex example how a changing ecosystem is opening up new um, avenues and, and new um, playgrounds for, for geopolitical contest. Um, so, David... Uh David Mike Perky from the U.S. Center, and I have a request. And once again, it's small and short. Yeah, and first of all, a request. Could Marie circulate the best geopolitics for dummies article that she knows for <laughs> us physical scientists in the Institute? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, and my question is, um, and we've been talking a bit with Michael lately and his group about, you know, what are the sort of local impacts on water resources of these fossil fuel development ideas and uh, projects and could that somehow be used to quantify to decide which ones get left in the ground and which ones could potentially be burned along with the equity issue that you raised that Shivan's working on um, do we have a, a governance system in place that could actually decide and allocate those sort of development rights and if not what would it take to put one in place Anyone want to respond to that? You know, I, mm, there, there, there are so many dimensions to what is perhaps one of the biggest industries in the world. Um, and, and the governance question, you could ask that governance question about the UNFCC and what, and what its, uh, its throw weight is right now in terms of the overall equity conversation as it is. Um, I think it's worth sort of upsetting, not upsetting the conversation, but, but adding this dimension to the conversation so that uh, we're a little bit more um, honest about the impl impl implications in the ongoing context in which uh, equity is invoked, whether it's response measures that Saudi Arabia may, may invoke, where it's already... Well, you can look at this from the standpoint of rents, of the economic profits that have been accrued from fossil fuel uh, production historically, and who's benefited and who's not. And there's an interesting analog there to uh, the, the conversation about common but differentiated responsibilities and capacities, and the two can be connected. The solution space is very difficult. It's a minefield, and that's why I think, you know, 
we, we, we welcome ideas about how to approach this from a political economic perspective because at the heart of this uh, is interest politics and how decisions are made at national levels. And, you know, that's some of the stuff that, um, that the new, new, new climate economy is taking on from a rather savvy approach, I think, uh, thank, thanks to Perrin and his input. Yes, and um, in, on dummies, um, but geopolitics, I think the, 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 one of the later issues of the Climate Policy Journal uh, from, from uh, autumn 2013 is about the geopolitics of climate change, a special issue and where we actually contributed a piece about how China, India, Brazil and South Africa are collaborating and what that means for climate negotiations and the wide ramifications and why they're collaborating. So I think you should pick that up. Interestingly. In that whole issue, there is no definition on what geopolitics means. <laughs> I thought it would be the Bible, it was not. <laughs> I will recommend our article there, as well, nevertheless. Um, it's a good read. Uh, Hi, um, my name is Bart Rickle from the Davis office in the US. Um, I'm not, by no means a, an extractive or fossil fuel expert, but there are some examples, I think, where fossil fuels are left in the ground. Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, there's very strong opposition uh, uh, to uh, glass, uh, gas exploitation based on uh, earthquake risk and uh, uh, environmental degradation uh, or risk. Uh, Peru or the Western Amazon where oil is left in the ground for the moment because on, uh, of uh, deforestation risk and so on. So I'm just wondering if there's if there's any thinking in that direction where you can combine a localized environmental degradation and risk and uh, carbon emission uh, risks, and if that is sensible. And from my perspective, what a, what a resource degradation risk in particular, uh, seeing all the accidents that are happening with coal, coal oil, transportation, and uh, in the U.S. recently, for example. Yeah, thanks, Bart. Um, there's no reason why not, and I, I think that'd be a great, I mean, area of research to pursue. Interested in, you know, what other uh, SCI researchers are working on in that topic. But I mean, many of the several of the areas where there's um, more intense fossil fuel development likely to take place. I think Michael mentioned some of them, but you know, maybe water stressed areas. And um, I know you're working in Mongolia, so that could be one, one example in, in bringing in other other more localized factors. Um, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's worth remarking that, that the classic case of this is Ecuador. And some of you followed Yasuni ITT, which was just that type of, we'll leave it in the ground. Well, that program's been canceled. In fact, it's gone rather starkly 180 degrees in the other direction, uh, which is a bit shocking, which invokes, the, there, there is a parallel here to red, if you follow the red conversation. Um, you know, it's basically a deforestation issue. How do you ensure that you can actually keep it in the ground uh, forever? Um, because administrations change, politics change, context change. So we need to really think creatively in that area. Yes, we have a quick question from Roger Kasperson. Okay, just a, a quick question. There have been a number of comments about how a geopol geopolitical perspective doesn't help us out very much. But I'm sitting back here looking at a number of major books that have come out on global governance, and I'm wondering whether or not that's had any effect on your thinking. OK, who wants to respond? <laughs> <laughs> Is it like dead silent here? But, um... See, uh, <laughs> young people don't read books nowadays. That's the problem. <laughs> Yeah, our desk is all clean. Um, well, I don't know whether I'm uh, addressing Roger's question, but it's just linked to earlier Annika's question about the, uh, the neo-geo or the changing geopolitical uh, dynamics and how we are start to thinking, uh, really this changing pattern, how that impact on the environment and the development questions that we're looking at. I, I think it's a lot of those I cannot, um, maybe should go in the lens that how that was, we would say is a very inconsistent of this general discussion in the global governance uh, 
institutional max services, so what is there, what is the lack of there. Uh, but in relation to that, maybe I can just, just one minute to use a specific example also address Annika's question. Of course, you know, we see that on a time that the increasing global resource scarcity together with the changing geopolitical economic power pattern, they interact that they mutually reshape each other. One example is the rare earth uh, in China. And if you, we have a discussion brief, hopefully soon we'll be uh, ready. And if you look at you know, 20 years, and this China from a period of absolutely rich the dominance of supplying the world with rare earths, and they reach a point that they start to cutting it. Uh, it you know, to make the long story short, that in the further, in the earlier part, you would say that more or less China's increasing is to say the resource scarcity. Is so China used that as an economic advantage, really, to grow their. Uh, in a way, you would say is. To, uh, that pattern at that time shaped uh, China's notion on the resource at that time. But as China getting richer and more leverage on the political, geopolitical power stage in the world, they start to cut this. Uh, and of course, other people are not happy and there's dispute about this. But it's really a typical uh, question that, uh, that quite symbolic of a lot of those issues we're going to face and, and how those changing geopolitical power pattern on one hand uh, interact with the growing resource scarcity issues. And there, and this whole issue range, for example, now it's a lot of those things settled in the WTO mechanism, which arguably a lot of people think is only international governance mechanism that exists, but there's a lot of issues to say clearly WTO is not uh, the mechanism or adequate mechanism in handling those issues. Okay, final question, Svita. Yeah, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate uh, SCI for a fantastic day. Uh, before I make my comment, uh, since I know you're going to continue the discussions, I'd like to make a comment on this idea of the geopolitics. Uh, I think this is really an area where uh, ACI can make a difference. Uh, uh, though I would like to see a broadening of the dimension. Of course, it's in, in SCI DNA uh, to look at from the resource point of view. Uh, but also we know that a state-centric uh, approach won't do it. Because you have uh, companies that have much, much larger, you know, resources uh, in terms of financial resources than GDPs of many countries. Yeah? And uh, we have also trying to solve, of course, climate change has triggered, triggered a number of, 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 of transformations and continues doing so, and, but we are still so trying to solve them with old uh, formula. Uh, for example, with the state-centered that we, dis we thought that we could sit in the UN headquarters and decide what's going to be done and realize that that's not the case. Yeah, in other headquarters, other important decisions are being made. So unless we actually connect those, we, actually, we, we cannot really change the way things uh, operate. So I think uh, broadening uh, to have the dimensions of uh, uh, these changing dy dynamics of, of uh, environment, how they are triggering actually uh, a change in the geography of power, of course, and that, that we, can, we already see the signs uh, that uh, Europe is recognizing that. We can see G, G20 is much more important than G8 today. We can see that, uh, that uh, Europe is actually calling for new ideas of how we should understand development aid, because development aid is not anymore about ethical responsibility. It's also about how we can keep welfare in Europe. So it is uh, a completely different picture uh, where, of course, climate change has triggered this, uh, but we actually still on the surface, and I think a place like SCI with so many competences and so many uh, dimensions where, where actually uh, where, where, where there is really uh, 
uh, tentacles all over from Mongolia to to Africa to to everywhere in the world can really make a difference. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Simira, and, and um, I, I will not invite the panel to, to comment on, 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 on your comments, but I, I think uh, for a personal reflection, work that we did on, on the basic countries, uh, understanding why China, India, Brazil and South Africa collaborated, we needed to go outside of the environmental or climate negotiation scope and understand the broader spectrum of why they co collaborated in WTO and in BRICS and in IBSA and, and, and other constellations. And then a broader pattern is emerging, which actually explains a shift, some sort of, of shifting patterns in, in, in how uh, countries are collaborating and, and how they take positions in global negotiations such as uh, COP15. Now, so thanks a lot for your comments. Uh, I think they were well, well taken. Uh, a big hand to the panel, and uh, Per is, is going to uh, make his final uh, comments. So, a few reflections from, from Per about what, what did you learn and take home right, so uh, to report back to um, the um, New Climate Economy Governing Council? <laughs> well, yeah, and that, that nefarious body. Hey? Um, so, I've got one minute, and it's always nice to be the guy. I'm not quite the last guy standing between you and refreshments and all the rest, because Eric has a dubious honour, but I'll try and be a little bit brief and, and, and just offer a few reflections here. And, and apologies to everyone external, it, it turns a little bit sort of SEI-centric as we, as we think through what SEI can do and where, where SEI can be. But I, I think that the, one of the learnings here is that you, these are very disparate areas, and yet I think there is a, a common theme to them. Um, there is a long debate about uh, how to secure energy at different stages of development, and it has come, it's had very often collided head-on with the climate discussions and climate debate, simply from the reasoning that green is more expensive than brown and that more expensive is bad for the economy and pretty much that's, that's where you go. Um, I think the, the themes that come out of this discussion are, heading, are bringing in a richer set of discussions, which is exactly where the debate needs to be. One heading I would call optionality, and apologies that my economist background perhaps conditions my choice of language a bit here, but... The, the idea that the, the decisions you're making now, and especially in a world which is very, very rapidly changing, um, if nothing else from the very rapidly increasing claims on materials and resources, but also in many other ways, um, the decisions you're making now are much more long-lived than is often appreciated. So that isn't just about the lock-in into one pipeline and the lifeline of that pipeline, it's a lock-in into a development model in the case of Mongolia. Um, China is already facing many lock-ins and trying to steer its huge tanker all around and other countries are trying to look at China and see what that means for them. If there's any countries like China, it's a ridiculous notion, uh, but nonetheless there are, there are countries that are facing similar questions. And the idea then is that there's very much a space here for recommendations to policymakers to think not just in terms of the short-term cost and in narrow economics of, of the cost of energy or whatever metrics and, and, and mental models they're using in their planning and thinking and strategies, but also to think about not building long-lived assets in a situation like this, but do building institutions, building niche applications, financing systems, supply chains, um, thinking about how your system might need to be redesigned, market regulations, etc., etc. softer items that are going to that leave you with the option in an uncertain world of availing yourself of additional resources. Um, should it be the case that coal becomes much more scarce than we thought it would be temporarily or permanently? Should it be the case that renewables fall more, more quickly in cost, etc.? And to understand that, and to, that, that requires very much, it's, it's country-specific, but it, it, it goes very much with the, um, with the issues we heard about here. When Goya talks about lock-in, that is, that is exactly the, what you need to avoid in order to keep options open for the future. When we hear about past energy decisions having been very slow in adopting, uh, and when we hear about the infrastructure projects. So that's, that's one heading, I think, is there that can actually reach policymakers in this area. Another heading I would call fairly simply and simplifying insurance. Again, if you're facing a world where, where there's increasing competition for resources uh, or where there's lots of insurance and there are significant adverse scenarios, again, bringing the SEI tradition of thinking of scenarios, um, scenarios often used completely in the wrong way, or trying to find the most likely scenarios instead of looking at the boundaries and thinking about the most difficult scenarios that you might plausibly face. And this, of course, resonates with the whole climate debate, but it also resonates very much 
um, with the, the types of issues we, we talked about here. And in, in, it's worth paying for insurance. We know that. Um, and I, I think that the need here then is to understand pressures in effect on perceived self-interest to bring in the perspective Marie was talking about, about geopolitics. Uh, and also the, the work that, that Magnus more alluded to than presented uh, on thinking about exposure and thinking about how different uh, the overlap there with climate action, which isn't one about short-term growth, but is about robustness and resilience of your entire development model and infrastructure as you rapidly build it if you're a developing country. Um, so the, I think the, the, the takeaway here is that when, as SEI, we talk about these topics, we are not quote, just talking about sustainability, but we're injecting ourselves into very mainstream preoccupations with a lot of key decision makers, uh, and the decision makers who will make the most important decisions over the world's resources in the next decades to come. And that this is very much also uh, why SEI is now very well placed to, to make a contribution, I think, to the new climate economy project, because this is a space in which um, that will also operate. So, a few remarks, thank you. Uh, just thanks a lot, Per, for um, you know, helping me out here as a sidekick. Uh, it was really valuable, and we also got to know a little bit more about the new climate economy project. Thanks a lot. And over to you, Eric. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to say just a very few words. First, though, I want to say invite you all to the reception. Um, the reception is actually not for the science forum. It's for the opening of the new center. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, the Stockholm Center has been around for a long time. But we're at new, uh, it's a, um, a new location, new office space. Thank you. I'm a little jet lagged. Um, <laughs> And we would like to invite everyone over there. The way to get there is just like you went to lunch, go out that door, but then turn right and look for 87D Lene Gatan. And there will be either signs or people or a combination helping you up there. Um, but I just want to say some short words, not, not in terms of the content, because there was a, a lot of good reflection on that, um, as much as... I'm, I'm always just amazed, surprised, really pleased that SEI is a place where people just think it's the most normal thing in the world to think about some of the biggest questions uh, facing the world. You know, and this, is, this was a whole day full of it. I loved it. I'm so stimulated. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to give some thanks to the Stockholm Center because two years ago, they said, we're tired of having retreats where we just sit down and talk about operations. We want to say what we're doing. And they did that internally with a few guests. Next year, it was SEI-wide. This is the third year. I think it's a terrific idea. So, And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I did and that you will join us tomorrow as well. All right. And please, enjoy the, the reception. <laughs>